evening, everyone. Welcome to another YMCA DMC. Tonight we have a very special guest, um, a guest who's played for some of my favourite football teams, including Manchester United, Northern Ireland, and also Rangers. Um, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. And so I want to ask you, what's your name and where are you from? And tell us, what did you get up to whenever you were a kid, a teenager? What did you do for fun with with your mates? Hi, so thanks for having me on, by the way. Uh, it's great to be on. Uh, yeah, my name's Roy Carroll. Um, I came originally, f- I'm from uh, County Fermanagh, a uh, wee village outside of Ellis Gillen. And uh, I moved across England when I was 17 years old. Played for quite a few football teams. It's probably a big list, so I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, but my, my main passion was playing for my country and I got that opportunity to play for my country uh, Northern Ireland it was fantastic but uh, when I was growing up uh, as a young lad in Tamla a wee village outside Ellis all, all, all it was was like enjoying life and doing adventures walk, going, going camping and going around the back roads in the, in, in the countrysides of Fermanagh and uh, just playing football and playing every sport you can and uh, that's what I can remember my youth was uh, enjoying life and and just having mates and just living every moment. Brilliant. Brilliant. I know you, um, you said you had a long list of football clubs. Now, I don't have anything here to, to say that I know them, but I think you played for Hull and you went to Wigan. Yep. And you went to yep. Manchester United. Yep. Did you leave Manchester United and go to Rangers? No, it was West Ham. Went West, to West Ham, Ham, West Ham and then Rangers. Then Rangers, yeah. And then you went to uh, Denmark to No, went to Derby County first. Oh, Derby uh, County. For a year and a half. Yeah, and then, uh, then then I went to Denmark for a year and a half, came back, never had a club for about uh, nine months, ten months, and then I got a phone call from a Greek agent to go out to Offy in Crete. Yeah. Uh, a small island in Greece, and then moved to uh, Offy to Olympiagos. And then came home to came back to England to play for Notts County. Then I decided to move back to Northern Ireland to play for Linfield. Now I'm still playing at Dungannon at the moment, uh, so uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, just nice to get back playing football again at 43 years old. Brilliant. I know you made it. You nearly. I know you had a wee club just before you signed for Dungannon Swiss FC Mindwell. Yeah. Um, F- F- FC Mind. Yeah, FC Mindwell. Uh, uh, the the the, um, what they're trying to do is uh, the things very close to my heart, like mental awareness from in men. And uh, I had a few friends. Keith Gillespie was playing for them, and they asked me to come down. and And I love the uh, the setup, what they're trying to do. And I said yes, of course. I love to come back because I, I had a serious injury get, uh, for Linfield with uh, my knee, uh, yeah. ruptured, ruptured my ACL, and then uh, I was out for nearly a year and a half. And I came back to play for FC Mainwell. Which was uh, it was enjoyable. It was really good. Met a lot of good people. Yeah. Uh, the club's trying to do good things for mental health and uh, pushing it out there. And especially where the pandemic is at the moment, it's not going to get any easier. We we need to keep focus on mental health and help people as much as we can. But uh, the the pandemic closed the football down, and uh, the only other decision I had to do was uh, what am I going to do? My coaching's been closed down. I can't I can't play football week in week out. And yeah. I looked at the situation and says, right, uh, unique uni football that can play as elite football. So I decided to come back and Dungan give me the opportunity to come back and play again. So it was nice to get back playing, but I am really enjoying it uh, uh, at Dungan. A lot of good young players, uh, but we're not getting a bit of the luck of the gamers at the moment. And yeah. uh, hopefully things can change uh, and uh, get a few wins under our belt because it's a great wee family club, Dungan. Yeah. One and one of the best burgers in the RSA as well, though I don't think they're open at the moment. That's one Jimmy, thing I, I like haven't tried. I, I, I haven't. I haven't tried them yet. Oh, when I go open draw, you need to go like the best. <laughs> the Dungannon for like being near the bottom of the table most years, their burgers are at the top of the table. And as a guy who would be a connoisseur of burgers, like Dungannon burgers are incredible. So, but I'll, I'll leave that for you to decide. <laughs> just you've had a long career and um, that has spanned um over a quarter of a century. Oh that sounds really that's, that's a that's, long time. It is, isn't it? It sounds a long time. Like but, years. 
43 years it old. Doesn't still playing. It doesn't oh. feel long, though. It doesn't feel long. That's the problem. Sorry if that made you feel really old to say Jeez. that. Um, you've ruined me. <laughs> I know. I'm 32, so you've been playing football nearly as long as I've been alive. But uh, anyway, no. <laughs> what, what, what did the journey look like in becoming a professional footballer? You know, what made you choose football even as a... Uh, this might sound like a silly question, but what made you choose playing football as your profession? Kimia, it, it's... it's uh, it, Back in the day when I was younger, um, especially living in County Fermanagh, it was it was a difficult route to go down because not too many professional pl- uh, football players come out of Fermanagh and to go across the water or even go across the mainland Europe. But for me, all I was thinking about was be a professional footballer as a young lad. And uh, I got that opportunity playing for Bala Mallard uh, back in the day when I was playing 16 years old for the, the men's team. And the opportunity came along by playing in Belfast because uh, a lot of people remembered back in the 90s, not too many scouts would have went past Lisbon. So for me to get the opportunity to play for Battle of up in Belfast, then I got an opportunity to get across the water. And uh, it just started because I love the game. I love my whole family sports uh, football mad. And my dad's a goalkeeper. My rest of my brothers are outfield players. But I never started off as a goalkeeper. I started off as a striker because I was too small and any time the inju- uh, keeper got injured, I would have went in goals and I just started love- loving the, uh, the goalkeeping position. Then I started growing very quickly at 14 years old and I just made a decision, says, right, that's my position. I'm going to play goalkeeper at 14, for, uh, 14 years old and just focus on one sport at that age because, as I said before, I played many, many different sports and at a certain age, you have to make a decision and uh, I really dedicated myself to be a professional footballer and I didn't care what anybody said like people laughed at me uh, saying like you can't make it Roy it's very difficult and stuff like that there but uh, as you, if you give it 100% and you don't make it at least you can look back and say I've tried my best and I did that and I was in the right place at the right time when I got spotted by a, by a, a scout up in Belfast Incredible Incredible So with like a lot of hard work determination and focus you kind of got there. Your first club was Wigan up across the water, or was it? Hull? No, it was Hull, uh, Hull City. Hull I went City. to Hull, Yeah, I went to Hull City in ni- uh, ninety-five and uh, nineteen ninety-five. I went over, but it was just for a trial yeah. uh, for a week, and uh, I ended up being over there for a week. And I came back, and about a month later, never heard anything. And I thought my opportunity was gone. And I got a phone call, phone call out of the blue. My parents got a phone call out of the blue. And says we would like you to come back over on a two-year scholarship, and Perfect. and that was it. Like, just never looked back. It was difficult though; it wasn't easy going over, leaving my, a small village of uh, about a hundred houses, and going over to uh, probably the fifth biggest city in England, Hull. In Hull. Yeah. And it was massive, massive for me. And I'm not, I'm not going to be hiding away from the fact that I was homesick. It yeah. was very hard for me for the first two or three months, but uh, it's like anything in life. Uh, you meet new friends. You meet. You, you meet. Uh, you you have a family and you move on. And that's that's what happened to me. Yeah, no, because that's interesting. Because I know a few boys that have went across to America and they wanted to try to make a career in the MLS. And boys also in the went across to England and just homesick is what's ended their career. I remember reading a story um, years ago with Mick McCarthy, who was the manager of Wolves at the time. And he said that he had these two incredible Irish prospects coming through and they were going to be the next big big thing. And one was a guy called Mark McCann, who used to play for Portadown in Glenavon. I think he played for Dungannon as well. I think he's yeah. now involved in the Milk Cup teams. And the other one was Robbie Keane. But I think mm. whatever happened... I think Mark ended up back home, maybe due to homesickness or injury or whatnot. And um, <coughs> Rob, well, Robbie Keane's the top goal scorer for the Republic. So mm. it's uh, no, it happens. It happens. It's difficult. Like when you're a young, uh, young lad from Northern Ireland, or even now a young girl from Northern Ireland, because uh, women's football is getting big as well in England yeah. and uh, over here in Northern Ireland. After what Kenny Shields has been doing for the women's game, but for me, uh, when I went over, it was. Uh, I, I had to learn and to get out of the get out of the house and meet new people because I was people may think I'm talking rubbish here but I was very shy I'm a very shy person I keep myself to myself but when I when I need to talk I talk and uh, at, when I was younger I think I, I learned that from 
went moving across to the water because I had to look after myself at a certain age. And uh, these young players going across to England, uh, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. You know what I mean? Not too many people can get that opportunity. So uh, for me, you, you get out and try and uh, go to wherever city you're in, go out and learn the culture of the city and get to know people and just keep your mind active and, and don't worry about anything. But uh, it's it's easy said than done, trust me. I've been there myself for, for sitting in the house by myself for two or three months and thinking, oh, I can't wait to get home, I can't wait to get home. But I uh, spoke to my dad, had a big long talk to my dad and he says, Roy, get yourself out and do things. And and uh, I've done it and I, I loved every minute of it then, like, and get the new get to know the new people and my new teammates. And I started playing football in the first team, which helped as well. So it was uh, it was brilliant for me. So w- w- what did a day look like um, whenever you were playing in the Premier League? You know, what was your training schedule like? Well, uh, the Premier League, when I first went to the Premier League, it was uh, I played for a small team called Manchester United. I left League Two at the time to... Uh, to the, the one of the best te- teams in the world, so it was uh, it was nerve wracking going in. The first day I was really nervous going in, but anyhow the the training was uh, was very intense. So it was completely different training than what I was getting in the Premier League than it was in the lower leagues. And uh, going in going in probably around half nine nine o'clock in the morning, get on then training on the training pitch at half ten, and uh, leaving having a bit of lunch at lunchtime and leaving. Uh, doing a bit more training uh, after lunch and then leaving around four o'clock. So basically, it was completely different than I, I was used to playing in, in the lower leagues. Because in the lower leagues, you probably only train from half ten till about half twelve and go home. Because in the lower leagues, you don't have canteens like you do at Manchester United, and you have chefs making food for you and all that. So it was a different different kettle of fish playing for a, a massive team in the Premier League. But uh, the enjoyment of playing and training with quality players give you a lift every morning you wake up in the morning and say right I can't wait to get back get in the training and going to those facilities what you play the training was fantastic for me loved every minute of it it was uh first first year was very difficult because it was uh it was so mental toughness uh the end of that season I was completely shattered I was sleeping probably I could have slept for a couple of weeks at the end of the season because we were, we were focusing so much on games and, and it was all about, not not fitness-wise, but it was more mental tire, tire, uh, tire being tired, if you understand. Yeah. You, you played in a Manchester United team. Now, I did a bit of research and looked through the squad that you were involved in. So you played and actually played. So it's not even like some players who just, like even a goalkeeper who, you know, is the number two, the famous number two goalkeeper doesn't play as much. But, you played quite a number of games for Manchester United, um, but you played in a Manchester United team that had players like Cristiano Ronaldo, Wayne Rooney, David Beckham, Ruud van Nistelrooy, Ryan Giggs, Roy Keane, Paul Scholes, Rio Ferdinand, and my favourite player of all time, Diego Forlan. <laughs> you know, what was what was that like? You know, was, was Kino really as grumpy and mean as he is nowadays when he's a pundit? You know, was Ronaldo always destined to be the greatest player of all time? Like, what was it like having the likes of um, Paul Scholes and Wayne Rooney playing with you? Kimmy, I, I swear, uh, I'll tell you the truth. Like, if, when I was first went into Manchester United, I was really, really nervous, like I said before, thinking about what am I going to say to these superstars, you know what I mean? Yeah. But see, when I first walked in at uh, Carrington, the training ground, it was so relaxed. The boys were so like down to earth. Uh, like it was so brilliant. I, I felt like home. After end end of the sessions, after end of that first training session, I felt like I've been there for years uh, yeah. because they made you feel so welcome. And I think that was the uh, probably before I joined Manchester United. It was probably the only club, maybe Olympiagos when I was in Greece. Uh, what made me feel welcome at a club. Uh, it's just so so nice when you have a, a, a player like David Beckham coming up to you on your first day and introducing uh, himself to me, to me and he says, I'm David Beckham and I'm just staring at him, looking at him with my mouth wide open. You know what I mean? But uh, as I said before, <laughs> <laughs> but Kimmy, I, a lot of people talk to me and says, how, how, you don't realise who you played with. And I says, I know, but the, the, the normal, you know, human people, humans were, were the top of the, the top of the, top of the league like best players in the world whatever they've won so many league titles but 
it's just down to earth, you know what I mean? It's just like me and you. If you talk to them and they open up and we talk and we talk about the good days and the bad days and, and that's what Manchester United was all about. It was a really good family club. I think Ferguson bought that into the club. Uh, everybody comes through that front door is welcome to the club and you have to be like a family when you're playing, playing in a massive team like that there. Yeah, so that's, like, that's my next question is, you, know, you played under the greatest manager of all time, Sir Alex Ferguson, the boss. You know, what was, what was that like and what did you learn from him? Yes, I learned loads from him. He was the manager and that was it, you know what I mean? Uh, you have a lot of managers this day and age who wants to be uh, the manager, the coach, takes the training and everything. But Ferg's, Sir Alex was more like, uh, he's the manager, he does the team talks, he picks the team. He has a number two assistant who does all the uh, training on, on the training day. And uh, so Alex would have been walking around, speaking to the players on the pitch and seeing how they're feeling and all that. And he was more like a father figure to me. Uh, he was really good to me when I first went in, 23 years old, from a from a small club like Wigan. Uh, played in the lowest league. Uh, it took me about four, five, six years to get from uh, where I was when I first moved over to England to Manchester United. And uh, he knew I was nervous. But uh, if you don't have nerves, there's something wrong with you. And he, they looked after me really well. Not not just uh, not just the players, the the whole coaching staff, and so Alex was amazing. Like, but you know, you knew when you have to keep quiet when he came into the change rooms because if if uh, if you if the game's not going well, you have to very very keep quiet and let him do all the speaking. Sometimes he doesn't even speak. It's just his Scottish luck. He would look at you and. and and that would make you play better in the second half. <laughs> no, I was just, I was just, just thinking there. You must have been in the changing room whenever the infamous Beckham incident happened. <laughs> no, I came here. Uh, it, it was what uh, I think I wasn't involved in that game. I wasn't involved in that game. I missed it, but it was, uh, it was. I think it was reported for months afterwards, like because uh, he kicked the boot there and hit the uh, hit the wrong player, hit David Beckham, who who was. Everybody was always social media, all knew about him and all that there. And the TV cameras and the, oh, the press was embarrassing for the last, uh, for the two weeks after that. Like, took us a probably half an hour trying to get in the training ground every morning because there's so many, many TV crews and, and the press waiting outside to get information what was going on. And I was, uh, yeah, because it was, it was mad just to, uh, to, read, to read all those accounts. Because I remember Claire's day when I was a bomb for when I was younger. and um, but what was it like playing with Keane and Ronaldo? That's the two I, I would love to know about. You know, Keane's kind of a big personality at the minute in football. Um, Tip to Keane's... be maybe the next Celtic manager. And mm. he's just one of the most vocal kind of pundits. And then Ronaldo, you know, was whenever he arrived on the scene, because he he joined during your time there. Yeah. So, yeah. And then he, it took a wee while for him to kind of kick on in United, but then became Ronaldo. <laughs> now, I, I talk about Roy Keane first because uh, he's a leader. He was a leader of the team, like, and he was respected, but uh, he was very, very hard, like, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. every, not in a good way, being hard in a good way, because he wanted to succeed. The only way you can succeed is by working hard and training, working hard in the, on a match day. Yeah. And uh, the qualities what he had, people don't realise how the quality he had as a, as a leader in a team like Manchester United. Uh, I think he was. If you don't give hundred percent, you know you're going to get a kick up, kick up the backside. You know what I mean? Yeah. So no matter who you are, if you come in that team, you have to give everything you can for the cause. And and at the end of the day, you want to win trophies. Uh, you want to look back in your career and you say you've won so many trophies. And you look at Roy Keane's career, uh, how many trophies he's won at Manchester United. It's been amazing. And management it hasn't worked out for him because he's, uh, football's changed completely now. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very difficult to shout at people. Very hard to get people motivated by shouting at them. And it's just the way, it's just the way life is at the moment. So I think Roy Keane would be in, in knowledge in the game is unbelievable. It's just needs he probably have to change his the way of thinking, the way his attitude is uh, to the players. And I think he would probably end up learning that way because to get back in the management, that's the way football is. You, you, I watch England like you watch England players coming off the pitch and you see Southgate giving people kisses and hugs and hugs. Like back in my day, if you're getting subbed, you're getting you're not even getting a handshake, you know what I mean? You're just coming off the pitch and that's it. Yeah. Now it's just the way it is. Uh, if you come in half-time, 
uh, 10, 15 years ago, you could be getting a teapot thrown at you. You know what I mean? This day and age now, you, if you do that, you get in trouble. But uh, it's it's just where football is. It's nothing against it. Uh, coaches have to change. And uh, I know myself coming into coaching, I'm going to have to change because I can't keep screaming and shouting at people. Yeah. People take it. People go different ways. So you have to know the player. You have to know the people before you can do anything. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because there's like loads of funny videos of like Barry Fry when he was at Peterborough and <laughs> um, Needle and um, Warnock and all those guys just going absolutely like fuck mad in the changing rooms. It's it's, it's then, crazy then, though. It's it's crazy. Then you see then you see Ollie. Uh, you see Ollie at Manchester United and you see uh, Pep at uh, Man City. They're just talking through talking at half time and it's just all about uh, the game and doing this and doing that. But. I love the I love I love I I love some of the uh, uh, like a early two thousand manager or late ninety manager to a manager now talking at half time side by side and see the difference. Uh, It'll be interesting to see if Sir Alex. Because I think maybe did he decide to retire just when he knew it was tough enough. You know. the foot, but who knows? Who knows? I can't say yes and no. But for me, when you look at the bigger picture. Uh, I think players got a lot of power in football now, which is wrong to, for me. Uh, yeah. Which is wrong. I think uh, I think the manager should be in charge uh, of what's happening at the club because if he, I think they're the biggest. Po- uh, for so Alex was massive at Manchester United and he succeeded. Look at Klopp at Liverpool. Uh, he's he's massive at Liverpool. They won the yeah. first league title in so many years, but. Uh, that's what I think you need as a manager. You need to be in control of the players who you're bringing in and who, who and stuff like that. But there's, I think it's all this director of football's changing. But that's a different story, anyhow. Uh, I'm not really going down that route. But I would like to talk about Ronaldo. Hey, when he when we first bought him in at Manchester United, it was frightening. Great lad, really good lad. Uh, we were playing a pre-season. We were in America doing pre-season, and uh, he uh, we stopped off playing some uh, sport in Lisburn on the way home and I felt sorry for big John O'Shea I felt sorry for him like because we had a long journey we had two days to prepare for playing sport in Lisburn and this young lad on the left wing playing against John O'Shea was all over him uh, twinkle feet toes on him he was so quick skinny uh, spotty young lad uh, highlights in his hair and he was so quick I'd never seen a, a, a player with the ball at his feet so quick uh, unbelievable Two weeks later, he joined Manchester United and uh, couldn't speak a word of English. Uh, after two or three months, he was uh, I've said this many times, he was speaking better English than me after two or three months when he was at Manchester United. And uh, he just worked so hard. He worked so hard. I wish someone could video him what he did in the first five years, six years of his career, because his life was all dedicated to, to be a, a, pro, a top of the Top, probably top of the world got football player, and he ended up getting that opportunity, and he did it because he worked worked really hard for it. Like, and that's what gets me for young players. Young players would like to be like Messi and Ronaldo, yes, but don't forget, there's a lot of hard work in between big before time. you can get there. Big time, big time. I know. I just m- remember watching Ronaldo for the first time. You could just see that he was special, and you see him today. He just broke. The world record for the most goals ever, and it's, it's just incredible to watch. And there's rumours he may come back to Manchester United, but we'll mm. see if that happens. But Old Trafford, the theatre of dreams, probably if, at one stage it was the biggest stadium in England, and you played during the glory <laughs> years. What was it like playing in a packed Old Trafford? Come yeah, uh... I've been asked so many times this question, but I, I was very comfortable playing in Old Trafford. It was, I think I was more nervous when you're playing in front of just five or 10,000 people. But see, when you're playing in front of 60,000, 70,000 people, you just focus on the game, uh, yeah. focusing on the game. Uh, more nervous sitting on the bench when you're not playing because you're not focused on the game, more focused what's happening around you. And uh, when you're playing the game, you, you've just got that vision on the pitch and you just focus, focus, focus. So, I think if uh, I think that's the only thing I really enjoyed at Old Trafford was like when you look back and said, "Geez, it was 70,000 70, people you played in front of," and I just felt like, "Geez, it didn't feel like that many." But uh, 
it was amazing when you walk out in the tunnel and you're just walking on the pitch. Once you walk over that white line, you, you're in a zone. You're in a, you're in a uh, you're zone and you, all you're doing is like, let's get this game done and win the game, get three points. That's all you focus on. So it's, it's, it's funny to say. I probably could say it better when I'm sitting on the bench because I can see what's happening and you can yeah. hear everything. So I was, uh, thank God I didn't have to come on half the time, like at halftime or uh, half an hour in the game or something, because I think I would definitely be nervous. Well, speaking of focus, you, you did have a memorable match at Old Trafford against Tottenham Hotspur, mm. where Pedro Mendes got the ball just inside the Manchester United half and lobbed you, and you made a wonder save, or so it seemed. Uh, what it happened good... there? <laughs> I tell you, um, I don't know if he tried to lob me, mate. I think he's just tried to kick it as hard as he can. I don't know what uh, the situation happened. Like, for some reason, uh, I kicked the ball out and it went, to, it went to the player and he just smashed it right up in the air. And the thing was, like, I wasn't concentrating this time. I wasn't concentrating. All I was thinking was focusing on throwing the ball out to Gary Neville. Yeah. And the ball wasn't in my hands at the time and it just hit my chest and hit my hands and went over my shoulder. And I kept it out before I went over the line. So my reactions were really good from it. But uh, I think it didn't go over the line. Do you, what do you think? Do you think it went over the line? Uh, I don't know. I don't think, I don't, as a Manchester United fan, definitely not. No. I was a neutral fan, definitely. <laughs> Kimi, that, I've been talked. Uh, Kimi, I love that. I, I don't love it like because it happened to me. But I, I show that to young keepers in Northern Ireland now because it's, it's concentration is a major thing as a goalkeeper. Because if you, you see that a lot, you see that a lot now in a lot of younger keepers. You know, with like pitches are so immaculate, then there's one divot, and then if you're not concentrating, the ball could go anywhere. Um, and mm. concentration is key because you see the keepers making so many mistakes, and as a goalkeeper, you know it's unforgivable nearly to make a mistake because when you make a mistake, nine times out of ten, the ball's in the net. And then, and then if you make a mistake at like a club at Manchester United as well, it's more it's more worldwide wide and everybody sees it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you make a mistake on the probably the, the other half of the league in the Premier League, it might not be shown as much. But that one was embarrassing. Like I do put my hands up and say it was embarrassing. Like it probably would have been shown more in the, if you were playing in the lower league. But uh, for me, uh, for me, it's like it happens. We're not as I always say to people, we're not robots. We're human, and we make we will make mistakes in games. It's where you come back from them, yeah. and uh, especially young players this day and age, uh, especially young keepers, the ones I've been taking. Uh, it's all about uh, it's learning from that mistake. If you keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, we have a problem. But yeah. if you if, if it once in a blue moon, I'm not worried about it, like because we will make mistakes. The top keepers in the world all all make mistakes. Peter Smeichel was the greatest keeper in the world. But he made he made mistakes, but he made bigger saves. If you know what I mean. Yeah, that's great. I love that. He had big mistakes, but made bigger saves. Yeah. So so after Manchester United, you played um, for a few other clubs, but then you went to Denmark and played for Odense. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, yeah. And then you had a break, and then went to Crete, and then Olympiacos. You know, what was it like playing football abroad outside the British game? I, I tell you what, I've never thought I would have been going abroad, like further afield, like anywhere further than England or Scotland. And I, I tell you the truth, like if um, I really enjoyed it. I did, didn't really enjoy it. Denmark was a lovely country. People was really nice at it, in it. But I was going through a bad stage of my career then. And, uh, and the thing was, uh, I came back from Denmark and I played... I'd never had a club for about 10 months and I went to Greece and I changed my life around playing in Greece, a uh, different lifestyle. The weather was nice. It was beautiful. Loved the, the, the hot weather uh, playing in Crete. Then I got a move to a massive team in, in Greece called Olympiagos, which was massive to play Champions League. And I got my life back, back on track to playing football out there. And uh, But, I never would have thought when I was 17, 18 years old thinking, geez, I'd be playing in Greece or Denmark, but this will happen. This will definitely happen. So a lot of people over here will say, I want to go to England and Scotland. And I'm saying to them, like, yeah, the opportunity never closes if you don't make it in England and Scotland. Uh, why not go further afield? MLS, go to the MLS. Go. It's a big world out there. Go and enjoy it and play football all around the world if you, yeah. if you can't get the opportunity in England because it's massive. Uh, Australia is a big uh, they have a big league out there as well but 
Greece, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I love the hot weather, by the way. I really do like the weather. It's not like Fermanagh. Fermanagh's lovely. Fermanagh's like, uh, sorry, it's raining. But saying that, it's quite nice today. It is actually quite nice. So, yeah. Um, so, with, so you had quite a, a great club career, but you also had quite um, a great international career. What, what, what was it like playing for Northern Ireland? Mm. Kimmy, everybody's dream is play for your country uh, as a professional footballer but my dream was become a professional footballer first because that's the only opportunity you can get into your country play for your country yeah. and uh, when that tre- dream came through playing professional football, football my next aim was play as far as I can and get in that Northern Ireland squad and uh, I was quite lucky I made my debut when I was 19 years old and Kimmy, it's a dream uh, trust me uh, all my friends know me really well and uh, this country I love so much uh, and playing for Northern Ireland was a, it was a pleasure and I wish I had more caps I'm not, probably getting carried away like 45 caps I'm happy with 45 caps even if I had one cap I would have I would have st- still loved it like but with the, with the long career I had I wish I had uh, got at least over 50 but uh, for me was it was a pleasure trust me that's from my heart. That's really from my heart. Like I, I just love playing for my country. Some yeah. dark days, some ba- some really good days, uh, but that's that's not known for you. You get ups and downs. It's brilliant. Uh, I never thought I'd be sitting on the sitting in a major tournament in 2016 for Northern Ireland uh, after the after the, the career I had. Uh, it was it was brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, you played for Northern Ireland. From 1997 to 2017, so you played in those years that were, you know, recently we've seen quite successful years, um, but also there was years where Northern Ireland were just the weapon boys of international football. Um, you know, what, what the question I want to ask is, like, what changed within the Northern Ireland camps, you know, to, um, or in terms of, like, even training managers and players, that turned Northern Ireland into the kind of wee force that they are today, like the, the just, ultimate underdog, and that seem to always just pep up with a wee result. Kimmy, okay, it's, it's, I think it was down to the management. Uh, Michael and Neil was very dedicated to what he was trying to do. I'm not saying the old managers wasn't dedicated, but it was it was different. It was different. I missed Northern Ireland for five six years. I think it was. I was out of the squad for five six years. And when I came back in, Michael and Neil rang me up. He brought me back in, and it was completely different. Uh, the football players' attitude was different than it was before. Uh, it was uh, it, the training. Uh, the training was uh, a lot different. Uh, we had uh, we were working more on set players, attacking set players, defending set set players. But uh, the major thing was that uh, was Michael's Michael and Neil was working behind the scenes, but nobody could see it. On the pitch, because I, I think the first eight games, Michael and Neil was in charge. He never won. You know yeah. what I mean? He never won. But we knew it was working. As players, we knew it was working. And uh, we were worried, because Michael and Neil's contract was up. And as players, we were worried he wasn't going to get a new contract. And he ended up getting a new contract. And that and in that second campaign, he was in charge. It all came together. It all, at all the sessions, all the work we've been doing behind the scenes, all came together. And uh, we end up qualified for a major tournament. But the, the good thing about it was we just never qualified for the major tournament because we finished third or second. We came at top of the group, uh, which was was amazing for a small country of Northern Ireland. So did you go to the Euros with Northern Ireland? Yes, I went to the Euros in 2016. I I, I started the campaign 2000 uh, for the Euros, and uh, and I, I ended up getting rushed in the hospital before the Romania game with a really bad stomach problem. And uh, the problem was like I had a hole in my I had a hole in my test time because I was the uh, when I was got, when I had injuries I used to take a lot of Voltarol tablets yeah get get rid of the pain and get rid of the the swelling and stuff in my knees and my, and, my, and all the injuries you get and that made a hole in my test time and all the acid all the stuff was getting out of my stomach and it was just completely ru- ruined me so it was I was in, in hospital for three days. And then after three or four days, it just disappeared. And uh, I had it for three years solid. Like every, it was strange. It was every time, it was every June, 
it used to come for about three or four days and it went away and it came back again for three years. But then I found out what I found out what happened and I spoke to doctors and specialists and says, what have you been taking? And I said, I've been taking Voltarol. And I said, that could be the major problem. So stop taking them uh, tablets. And I touched wood, it's never came back. Yeah. Um, but so that, but that, that's what I'm saying about, that's what I'm saying about uh, uh, playing. Uh, you could be playing and something happens badly that day. And Michael McGovern came in. And Mike McGovern from, from down here in County Fermanagh. Great, great guy. Loving the bits. Really nice guy. And uh, he kept the spot, and and I was glad for him because he he played well. And he kept a clean sheet, and I knew knew myself that Michael McGovern would be keeping the next uh, playing the next game. And uh, of course, deep down, I want to play football and get yeah. to the major tournament and play. But when you have a when you have a good guy like Michael McGovern, I was really proud of him, and uh, especially the game against Germany, uh, and he he just kept them out. I know Germany scored, but. Uh, if he if they could have scored ten goals that game, and yeah. uh, we would never got out of the groups groups uh, group stage, but uh, he he kept it down, and we end up getting through by goal difference. Uh, he, was, he was a good he was a good number one for Northern Ireland for for that period. But last question about uh, playing for Northern Ireland. Yeah. Northern Ireland fans are known as probably some of the best fans, if not the best fans in the world. What is it like playing at Windsor Park on? An international night, you know, when Windsor Park is is bummed and bouncing, or is that kind of yeah? It's come here, see now, like with the, see nineteen thousand fans in the in the stadium, like it's it's banging, it's banging, it's brilliant. You know what I mean? Yeah. I missed that opportunity because uh, they were building they were building the stadium, and uh, um, and the, the, I think you only had one stand because the the south stand. I had a crack in at one time when the, the fans were doing the bouncy one time. So, oh, uni, yeah, the I, I hope I, <laughs> yes. yeah. oh, sorry, uh, the cop. Yeah. So, so uh, the we only had one stand when we were playing the qualifiers for 2016. But see, when I was sitting on the when I was when it was fully built, it was fantastic. But come here, Northern Ireland fans was always like that. Even when we had 11,000 in, when the, the old stadium was there, they were still bouncing. You know what I mean? They were fantastic. Yeah. Uh, they see the Northern Ireland fans that in France, they were credit to them all. Hey, they were brilliant. They were fantastic, yeah. and uh, they stick by us. The hardcore fans will stick by us, and 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 they will understand this country is a small country. It's uh, we have we haven't got a big pile of players to pick from. But see, when you have players you want to play and work hard and give everything for the cause, you can succeed anything in life. Yeah, brilliant. So some it's just some quite kind of quick fire questions for you. Um, who is the best player you've ever played with? Best player, um, I'm going to go for Paul Scholes. He, I've, I've said it all the time. Paul Scholes, great player, really good. Always wanted the ball off me, and I always trust him as well to never lose it. He was a good player. Brilliant. And who is the best player you've ever played against? Uh, Terry Henry. He hit saying it like, but he scored a few goals against me. Yeah. Quality. Um, <coughs> who is the most underrated player you've ever played with? Young Fletcher. Darren Fletcher. Yeah, when I was at Manchester United, he was quality player. Like he went through a bad time, like health wise, and yeah, uh, th- he's a big, big player. Like he was good. You don't really see people until you play with them up close. Yeah, and he's now got a quite a big job at Manchester United. Yeah, he's a coach there now, isn't he? No, I think he got promoted. Is he? Yeah, he's moved director up. Director of football, but he's like working up in the kind of boardroom level. Oh, so he's moved on as well from coach up to there. I yeah, thought he was so, coach. Yeah, I think oh. he recently got um, promoted to be um, the head of football development or something. Um, oh, right. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. The, that's the last couple of days. He is technical director of Manchester United. So he'll work mm-hmm. hand in hand with the new uh, director of football, Manchester United. So he's a so, good guy. Good guy. So, what moment stands out as a proud moment in your career? Uh, come here, that's, that's, geez, there's a lot. There's a lot. Uh, just getting an opportunity to be a professional footballer. Yeah. That what was, was it. your most memorable That's my match? proudest moment. Uh, my... Uh, that's... Uh, 
Swindon away for Hull City. That was my first professional game in, in English football. Wow, and that's what I remembered, and I, I remember, and I, that's all I can remember. I remember nil nil at half time. I said, "Jesus is easy," and we came back out half time, and we lost the game three 0 <laughs> <laughs> So I know I'm laughing here, but I know I'm laughing, but he may, it tells you a story. There's two halves, so you, you have to focus on the, even uh, even until the last, until the referee blows the final whistle. Nothing's easy in life. Oh, always the way. Um, and so at 43 years old, you're still playing for Dungannon Swifts. You know, what's your secret? There's not many players still can say they can play at that age. My secret is because I'm mad in the head, that's why. <laughs> I'm mad in the head. No, come here. Um, the secret is like when you get older, you understand your body a lot more and you know yeah. what you how much you can do things and, and what you can't do and you have to be careful. But I think that's that's what senior players are all about. They know what to ha- what they can do and what they can't do and look after yourself. And I think I'm more I'm more uh it's just nice to be playing as well. I just love being back playing football again. It's uh, especially through this pandemic. And as I said before as I said to many people, it's it's hard for a lot of people out there at the moment not playing football. And it, it helps me to get out and play football. It, it relaxes me. And, uh, and the secret is, as I said before, is just it's just enjoying the game. Brilliant. And so we each week when I'm say pour down, I host these um, podcasts, these live on Facebook sessions called DMCs, which is a deep, meaningful conversation. And over the last kind of number of weeks, we've been talking about mental health and, and mental health awareness. So in your career, you know, you must have had, you've had your ups and you've had your downs. But the question I want to ask is, you know, how did you cope with um, just the lowlights of your career? Um, and also, you know, how did you cope with not being selected for matches at day, matches that maybe you trained hard during the week and then you maybe were on the bench? So like, how, how did all that kind of stuff affect your mental health and then how did you... How did you learn to kind of cope with that? Mm. Yeah, that uh, the th- the thing was uh, to- we we'll go talking about the the playing side of it. Like uh, when I first went over to England, I was playing for the youth setup. I was playing for the youth setup week in and week out, so it wasn't too bad that way. But when you start when you're not playing football, <clears throat> move on. We we'll fast forward when I moved to West Ham. And uh, I had a few slight injuries before that, and I was out for a month. But I had a serious injury when I was at West Ham, and it was a really bad back operation I had to go for. Uh, and uh, it was uh, I was out for nearly I think it was nine months, ten months I was out for. So that really, I'm going to tell the truth here. There's no point hiding hiding things here because have to be you have to be tr- truthful to people in this in this world. Yeah. You have to know what's behind the scenes as well as a professional footballer. Um, it was hard for me because I wasn't prepared for that injury. I was not not prepared to be missing 10 months of my life playing football and training sessions. All I was prepared was to play football, train every week, play football every weekend. And that was taken away from me. Uh, it's no one's fault. Like It was just one of those situations. But now, fast forward again to Northern Ireland, when I played for Northern Ireland, and with that st- stomach problem, I could handle it because I've been through that situation before. And I could handle not uh, being injured and not but getting back in the team because uh, I could understand the situation, what happened before, and I never got let let it get me down. When I was playing for Wigan, I let it get me down, and I lost. I had no part. I wasn't positive about anything. I was just looking about all the bad things, and uh, depression took over, and the drinking took over, and. Uh, I was suffering for three or four years without anybody knowing how bad I was. And that was really bad. And, and, uh, and that's the thing for me now is like, I've learned from those, mis- those, it's not a mistake. It's not, it's not a mistake. It's you, you never, you're never ready for these. Uh, no one's ready for these problems. But I think for me, once I knew what I went through before and this thing with the my stomach problem with Northern Ireland, I could handle it a lot more. Mm including my knee as well, when I was out for over a year with my knee, I can handle it now because I was mentally ready for it. I was mentally yeah. prepared for it this time. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say to young people is like, 
you have to have something outside football as well or outside any sports thing, have something else that you can do. Because when I was injured for 10 months, all my mates are big football fans and they talk about football and I was so bad. I was so depressed and all I wanted to do was get away from football and think about something else. But uh, it was just all my mates were football fans and, and it was really bringing me down and depression was really bad for me. And so, and so, um, with with your life now that you're a little bit older, more experienced in life, you know, like how do you protect your mental health even now? Um, and with and kind of what advice would you give to a young person, um, who want to get, build their mental health, um, even just like, who don't play football but just, um, feel like they're maybe struggling with hmm. lockdown. Or no, it's uh, like come here, mental health. Ha- yeah, come here, young ones, uh, young ones, even senior people. It's like, uh, for me, uh, it's all to be positive, be positive, be be good to yourself and be active, keep your mind active because it's very difficult. Uh, even now, sometimes I uh, sometimes I still str- struggle, like, and you get in a routine, you get back in the old routine. You just have to get a, a, a bad routine and do a good routine, do good things, get up, make your bed, go for a walk, do something. Uh, for young ones it's difficult at the moment with this pandemic but uh, there's always light at the end of the tunnel and uh, just keep keep talking to your friends keep talking to your mum and dad keep talking to you, anybody get things out of your head don't keep things in do not keep things in because when I kept things in it blew up my mind blew up and I had everybody thought geez Roy's went mad like but I, I built up for nearly two or three years with me and no, everybody thought I was I was okay but when I went behind, when I went home and closed the doors, I was a completely different person, and I was quite lucky. I got out, I got out, I got myself fixed up and tried to move countries and uh, had good people around me then, and uh, I've just got myself back and back where I belong, like and loving life again, enjoy life. It's short. Life is short, and you don't have a you don't have enough days in in the week. But for me, it's. Uh, uh, the, the major one is be active and keep active and keep mentally strong Super Roy thank you very very much for taking time out just to speak with us um, it's, we really appreciate your vulnerability and honesty in answering those questions and kind of opening your life uh, as a professional footballer but also you know your, your private life in terms of your mental health so we really really appreciate that and as, a, as I say after every um, DMC, YMCA Porter Down. Even during lockdown, we're still here to support young people um, through whatever's going on. And we're, you can contact us through all our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, you name it. Um, and if you need anything, just give us a shout. So Roy, thanks very, very much. And um, we hope you have a good rest of the season with Dungannon. And you never know, you may line out for the port someday. <laughs> Come here. I would like to, uh, come here. Thanks a lot. Hey, thanks for having me on. I would like to just say to the people out there, make sure it's okay. It's okay to talk. Hey, don't, don't, don't hide. Don't hide anything. Come out and speak to It's great that uh, there's so many people talking about mental health now, but we need to keep pushing it. Trust me. We need to help people out there. Brilliant. Well, thanks, Roy. Okay. Really, really appreciate it. And um, yes, again, YMCA Poor Down is here to support young people through the pandemic, through lockdown. If you need anything, just contact us through our pages. So, yes, thank you very, very much for listening in tonight. And we will hopefully see you all soon once we open up again. So, see you later.